All right, greetings, everybody. Hello, everyone. What's going on? It's your girl Tiffany coming through right here live in effect. On today, Black History, Blackology. And, <laughs> but now today, Black History, I'm going to be dealing with two subjects. One is going to be about Jeff Jefferson Franklin Long, who was a congressman and a congressman from Georgia. Um, also he was a Republican, so I'm going to go into that. And then also I'm going to talk about a story, a tragic event that took place back in February 4th of 1999 in New York city, where, uh, Amadou Diallo was killed by the police and he was executed 41 times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with him. Okay, and let's get into his story. So make sure you guys subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, share the channel, all that great stuff. You can share this video and whatnot. So let's go ahead and get started with Amado Diallo. All right, so hopefully you guys can see my screen here. Okay. All right, so who was Amado Diallo? Well, let's look at his story. What happened? So in the early hours of February the 4th, 1999, a 23-year-old Guinean immigrant named Amadou Diallo, he was born on September 2nd of 1975, was fatally shot by four New York City Police Department plainclothes officers, Sean Carroll, Richard Murphy, Edward McMillan, and Kenneth Boss. Carroll would later claim to have mistaken him for a rape suspect from one year earlier. The four officers who were part of the now defunct street crimes unit were charged with second degree murder and acquitted at trial in Albany, New York. Diallo was unarmed and a firestorm of controversy erupted at the event. As the circumstances of the shooting promoted, I mean, prompt outrage both, both inside and outside of New York City. Issues such as police brutality, racial profiling, and contagious shooting were central to the ensuing controversy. So basically, the reason why the police shot him that many times because they mistaken his identity for a rapist, a serial rapist. So but they were charged with the crime. And of course, you know how it is. They get acquitted and they get on and go about their business, go about their day. They'll get a new job opportunity or they get a pay leave and all this other stuff. So while the family is still grieving and still suffering, but let's continue. Let's learn more about this brother. So who is he and where was he born? So he was one of the four children born to Saku and Kadijatu Diallo and part of a historic Falupe trading family in Guinea. He was born in Sino County in Liberia on September 2nd of 1975 when, while his father was working there and while growing up followed follow his family to Togo, Singapore and Thailand and back to Guinea. In September 1996, he followed other family members to New York City and started a business with a cousin. According to his family's lawyer, he sought to remain in the United States by filing a political asylum application falsely claiming that he was from Mauritania and that his parents had been killed in fighting. He sold video cassettes, gloves, and socks on the sidewalk along 14th Street during the day. Now, the tragic event. All right, so in the early morning of February 4th, Diallo was standing near his building after returning from a meal at about 12.40 a.m. Police officers Edward McMillan, Sean Carroll, Kenneth Boss, and Richard Murphy, all in plain clothes, drove by. Carroll later claimed that Diallo matched the general description of a serial rapist reported a year earlier, or that he might have been a lookout for drug dealers operating in the area. The officers later claimed that Diallo ran 
up the outside steps towards his apartment house doorway at the approach, ignoring their orders to stop and show his hands. The porch light bulb was out and Diallo was backlit by the inside uh, vestibule light, showing only a silhouette. Diallo then reached into his pocket and withdrew his wallet. Seeing the man holding a small square object, Carol yelled gun to alert his colleagues. The officers opened fire on Diallo, claiming that they believed he was holding a gun. During the shooting, led officer McMillan tripped backward off the front stairs, causing the other officers to believe that to believe he had been shot. However, a witness testified that they shot with no warning. The four officers fired 41 shots and with a semi-automatic pistols, striking Diallo 19 times. Diallo had recently applied for political asylum, but had lied on his application. Thus, it has been suggested that he may have feared the police were with immigrant immigration services. It has also been suggested that Diallo's English may not have been good enough to understand that the officers were plain clothes police and he instead may have feared that they were going to rob him. All right. The investigation found no weapons on or near Diallo. What he had pulled out of his pocket was a wallet. The internal NYPD investigation ruled that the officers had acted with policy based on what a reasonable police officer would have done in the same circumstances. Not, nonetheless, the Diallo shooting led to a review of police training policy and of the use of full metal jacket bullets. On March the 25th, 1999, a Bronx grand jury indicted the four officers on charges of second degree murder and reckless endangerment. On December 16th, a court ordered a change of venue to Albany, New York because of pre-trial publicity. On February 25th of 2000, after two days of deliberation, a jury in Albany acquitted the officers of all charges. So, so basically, again, they got away with it. Now, here's the thing. If you were off-duty police officer, obviously that's what they were off-duty, right? And they were in plain clothes. How can somebody determine that you are officer if you got on plain clothes for one? You did not announce yourself as a police. So for somebody like uh, Diallo, who is an immigrant, right, a black immigrant at that, coming to a place like America, and he doesn't know much about the law enforcement in America, obviously. Okay. He didn't know who they were because they did not announce themselves as police. He thought they were some group of niggas trying, excuse me. He, he thought they were some group of guys that was trying to rob him. They was going to do something. He didn't know any better. So... Instead of them announcing who they were and showing their badge like they should have, they turned around and executed this man 41 times. And you know what I find very disrespectful? <laughs> I see that now people, some police officers got pictures of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass painted on their cars like as if that's going to change everything that's going to make everything all right no i don't care how much you put a harry tubman and frederick douglas on your car that's not going to take back all those people those innocent black people that were killed here in this country that's not police reform to me that's just decoration. It looks good. You try to dress it up, but what about the policies? These policies should have been implemented for a long time. Way before Biden got into the office. It should have been implemented. It should have been enforced in the police department. In the justice system. So sitting up here painting a picture of Harriet Tubman and uh Frederick Douglass and riding around with the names of the black people on your 
God is not doing nothing for the citizen. It ain't helping us. So the average black person don't really give a fuck about all of that. I mean, I'd say that we don't care for those ancestors, but we don't give a fuck about the decoration on your car. We give a fuck about the policy. We give a fuck about the reform. That's what we look at. We're not looking at all that extra stuff that you're trying to do. And hugging a police officer ain't a form of reform either. It's not a reform policy. I don't care how many times you hug a damn officer. But let me go ahead and continue. All right, so here's the aftermath. In the April of 2000, Diallo's mother and father filed a $61 million lawsuit against the city and the officers, charging gross ne negligence, wrongful death, racial profiling, and other violations of Diallo's civil rights. In March of 2004, they accepted a $3 million settlement, one of the largest in the city of New York for a single man with no dependents under New York State's wrongful death law, which limits damages to financial loss by the deceased person's next of kin. Anthony H. Gare, representing the Diallo family, argued that federal common law should apply. In the April of 2002, as a result of the killing of Diallo and other controversial actions, the, crime, the street crime unit was disbanded. In 2003, Diallo's mother published a memoir, My Heart Will Cross This Ocean, My Story, My Son, Amadu, with the help of Arthur Craig Wolf. All right, so, oh, here goes another one. It says Diallo's death became an issue in the 2005 New York City mayoral election. Bronx Borough President and mayoral candidates candidate of Fernando Ferrer, who had protested the circumstances of the killing at the time, was criticized by the Diallo family and many others for telling a meeting of police sergeants that although the shooting had been a tragedy, the officer had been over indicted. I don't know how an officer can be over indicted if they shot this man 41 times. But anyways, boss had a Boss had shot another unarmed black man dead in 1997. After the trial, Boss were reassigned to death duty, but in October of 2012, Commissioner Raymond W. Kelly restored Boss' ability to carry a firearm. As of 2012, he was the only one of the four officers still working for the NYPD. In 2015, he was promoted to sergeant in accordance to police policy, which is not subject to review by top department officials he retired from police work in 2019 <laughs> that's a slap to the face but that's the way it goes huh all right so if you guys want to look more into the story you can go on wiki one and you can go down here with this is reference. All right, here's the reference page right here. All right, here's the article, heavy.com. What happened to Amadou Diallo's killers? As you can see, that's his mother and that old Al Sharperton. 
So here's the article. You can look it up, heavy.com. That goes into more story about the killing of this brother. And also, you can check out the book for free on archive.org. This book is called My Heart Will Cross This Ocean, My Story, My Son Amadu. All right, so it was a story uh, or biography or autobiography by Kaditu Diallo with Craig Wolf. So you guys want to check it out, you can go to archive.org, look up this information, look up, look at the books. Uh, There's plenty of books on this website you can check out for free. Um, you can purchase it. All that great stuff. So it'll let you borrow for an hour. It'll let you borrow for two weeks. All that great stuff. So yep. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into the second topic, but just give me a moment, I'll be back. All right, so the next topic I am going to get into is about Jefferson F. Long, and I'm going to show you who he is. All right, so that's him. All right, so you can find this information on Wiki One. You can look up Wikipedia if you want to learn more. So who was Jefferson F. Long? So Jefferson F. Long, or Jefferson Franklin Long, was born on March the 3rd of 1836, and he was he passed on February the 4th of 1901. He was an American politician from Georgia. He was the second African-American sworn into the U.S. House of Representatives and the first African-American congressman from Georgia. He was the only African-American to represent Georgia until Andrew Young was elected in 1972. Long was the first African-American representative to speak on the floor of the U.S. House opposing the amnesty bill that is exempted former Confederates serving in the office from swearing allegiance to the Constitution. OK, so. Now, let's look at his story. All right. Long was born a slave by a slave mother and a white father near the city of Knoxville in Crawford County, Georgia, on March the 3rd, 1836. He taught himself to read and write an illegal act for slaves. Long became a successful merchant tailor in Macon, Georgia. Long was elected as a Republican to the 41st Congress to fill the vacancy calls when the U.S. House declared Samuel F. Gove not entitled to the sea and served from January 16, 1871 to March the 3rd, 1871. Long was not a candidate for renomination in 18, 
1870 because of anti-reconstruction efforts by the white majority Georgia GOP, but did serve as a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1880. Despite long, brief tenure in the U.S. House of Representatives, he was able to promote several reconstruction efforts. He resumed business in Macon, Georgia, and died there on February the 4th of 1901. He was interred in Linwood Cemetery. All right, so, and you can go down here to the reference and you can find more information. All right. So it gives you the websites where you can go and here's the bibliography and here's the external links. All right, so I have more sources that I would like to share regarding to Jefferson F. Long. Just one second. All right, so if you guys want to uh, look up more information,
This one is called Jefferson Franklin Long, the public career of Georgia's first black congressman. All right, so. It goes on to say that it will soon appear apparent how Long's influence would be exerted. He was not elected, evidently did not seek to be to the Constitutional Convention that he met in December 1867 or to the state legislature chosen in the spring of 1868. Rather, he was a Republican organizer and speech maker with little interest in holding office. He served as the president of a local grand club for the elections of 1868. He was very much in evidence at a radical convention to choose a candidate to con for Congress from the 4th District. The Republicans won the state elections in April, electing a governor, Rufus B. Bullock, and winning narrow majorities in both House of the Legislature. The grand ticket, however, was soundly defeated in the fall as a reward for his services to the party. In March of 1869, Long was elected to the 29-member State Central Committee in which various factions struggled. Effective power was in the hands of the committee chairman. All right, it says, before his service on the committee, Long was found reason to question his reliance on the Re Republican Party as the best vehicle for securing rights to the freemen in the fall of 1868. Using an ambiguous session of the new state constitution, some Republicans in the legislature had joined with the conservatives, later Democrats, to expel almost all the black members of both houses, 25 from the House, three from the Senate. Long attended a radical meeting in Atlanta that protested this action and petitioned Congress to reorganize the legislature and re recease the black. Governor Bullock lobbied energetically in Congress to this end for the rest of the year and was not successful until December 1869. Shortly before Congress acted, Long joined with several others Republicans of both races to oppose his plan for a third reconstruction. Long's motives in opposing the governor are not known, but he might have come to distrust Bullock for exploiting the issue of the recalcitrant legislator in order to keep his own followers in power. More likely, however, Long's attention had been diverted from politics to other matters involving the freemen. In September 1869, Long was the head of a committee that issued a call for a convention of Negroes to meet in Macon the following month in order to discuss education and labor problems. Collaborating with Long was Henry McNeil Turner, a black preacher and politician from Macon, whose explosion from the legislature had left him bitter and delusioned with white Republicans. All right, so I'm not going to go any further on that, um, but this is more detailed about Jefferson Long and his life as a congressman from Georgia. So you can read this up for yourself. All right. So like he basically open up the gateway for many blacks, especially those who come from the South to get the opportunity to be in Congress, to be able to have a voice and have a power. So if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have people like Andrew Young, right? You wouldn't have people like Raphael Warnock in the position of power they're in today. All right, so, oh, and you guys can check out, hold on, you guys can check out the source at um, jaster.org, J-S-T-O-R.org. Uh, it's published by Clark Atlanta. The source is called Phylon in the 1960. Um, well, it's been around since the 1960s, and it came out in 1981. Is the second quarter, volume 42, number two. 
page 145 to 156. Okay. All right. All right, then. So with that being said, you guys, I want to thank you all for watching. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. And please be safe during this pandemic. And until next time, may peace and power elevation be to all of you. And I'll reconnect with you guys later. All right. So this your girl, Tiffany, and I'm out. All right.